Good morning and welcome to the fifth Sunday of Lent. So today our broadcasts are all on the radio and digitally, so we are grateful that you can listen in wherever it is you have found a place to watch or listen. A few announcements before we begin today. We want to give thanks for our radio broadcast today that's given in memory of Albert and Emma Rao, given by Warren and Elaine Rao, so we are very grateful for them for that gift. As well as we want to hold up the family of Rosemary Stock as she passed away, and we, so we want to remember to keep their family in our prayers and offer them our sympathies as they go through this time of grieving. We have sign-up sheets still for the meals each day delivery that will be going on. Those are in the bulletin board in the commons, so we are still looking for help with that during this time to help make sure that people are getting fed adequately. And we are still working on personal care kits that we've been gathering together for the last few weeks. The supplies that we're looking for are combs, towels, bars of soap, toothbrushes, and nail clippers. And we're planning to put those all together on April 28th. Of course, these days planning is a more uh, tentative thing, so we look forward to still being able to put those kits together to offer through Lutheran World Relief. And then likewise, we ask that you just stay tuned in the coming weeks as we figure out what it will look like to worship, when it is that we will worship again together. And for the time being, we're going to continue to to gather together via different mediums like this, through the radio, through our YouTube channel, through our Facebook page, all the ways that we can still gather together to worship, but at the same time do our best to help prevent the spread of this coronavirus. Now, if you were listening last week, you might remember I offered a bad joke at the beginning, and sadly I don't have any new material. So I would say, from a scriptural perspective, Go to James chapter 4, the 8th verse, and it says, Wash your hands, you sinner. So there you go. Okay, well, we're not listening in for my bad jokes or for my announcements. We are here because we are going to worship. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God who is present, who gives life, who calls into existence the things that do not exist. Amen. Now we continue with confession and forgiveness. If you were to keep watch over sins, O oh Lord, who could stand? Yet with you is forgiveness, and so at this time we reflect and confess our sins within our hearts. Gracious God, have mercy on us. We confess that we have turned away from you, knowingly and unknowingly. We have wandered from your resurrection life. We have strayed from your love for all people. Turn us back to you, O God. Give us new hearts and right spirits, that we may find what is pleasing to you and dwell in your house forever. People of God, receive the good news. God turns to you in love. I will put my spirit in you and you shall live, says our God. All your sins are forgiven in the name of Jesus Christ, who is the free and abounding gift of God's grace for you. Amen. Join with me as we pray the prayer of the day. Almighty God, your Son came into the world to free us from all, free us all from sin and death. Breathe upon us the power of your Spirit, that we may be raised to new life in Christ and serve you in righteousness all our days. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. So this is about the point before the readings where I would usually do the children's sermon. Now, I hate to leave anyone disappointed, especially our kids out there. So as I was thinking about what would a children's sermon look like today, I thought about how hard it might be for them to follow our gospel reading. 
In our gospel reading here shortly, we're going to hear about the death and the resurrection of Lazarus. And it follows this narrative where Lazarus is sick and they send word to Jesus. And Jesus waits a little, but then him and his disciples show up. But by the time they already get there, Lazarus is dead. And there's mourning, there's grieving, even Jesus himself cries. But then what follows after that is the resurrection of Lazarus. And I thought, how is it that we could go about incorporating that into a children's sermon? What is it that I would want to explain to kids about this? And so I started thinking about my own children and about how when they're at that little age of around four or five years old and they have a favorite toy and it breaks, or maybe they have a favorite stuffed animal and they drift around forever and it finally rips and tears. Either a seam gives way or an eye pops off and they are heartbroken. Now the thing is, we know as parents, we know that there's probably a way to fix this. If the toy can be fixed or not be fixed or replaced or not be replaced, seams can be re-sewn, eyes can be sewn back on, those things can be fixed, they can be recovered. So we know that, but at the same time as we look at our child and they have tears in their eyes and we see the pain that they have as something that they love being broken and they don't know that it's not the end of it. We know that their pain is real. We know from our own perspective, it doesn't seem like a big deal, but to them, it is. It could be their whole world. I think of my daughter's own stuffed bunny that she still has around, but for the first few years of life, that was her friend that she took everywhere. And it went through so many different reiterations, so many sewings and patchings, and each time I remember the look on her face, both when she thought her toy was gone, when she thought that her bunny was gone forever, and also, the joy that she had when she received it back after it had been repaired. And so I guess I would tell the kids if they were up here with me today, that those feelings, that when we encounter those events, that it's real, that it's okay to still feel that way, even though we don't know what the outcome is gonna be. That it's okay to live in a place of hope, to hold on to the things that we care about, but to know that ultimately that they're going to be okay because God loves them more than any love they have for a toy. And that through it all, God's not going to leave them and God's not going to let them waste away, but that God's going to tend to the promises that they make to that child even more than we can tend to a stuffed bunny that belongs to a child. So that's what I would talk to the kids about if they were here today. And kids, I hope there's a few of you listening out there today. Remember that you are loved so much more by God than you could ever imagine. More so than you even love that favorite toy of yours. So we give thanks for that today. We give thanks for the love of God for all of our children. Our first reading this morning comes from the 37th chapter of Ezekiel. The hand of the Lord came upon me, and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord, and set me down in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. He led me all around them. There were many lying in the valley, and they were very dry. He said to me, Mortal, can these bones live? I answered, O oh Lord God, you know. Then he said to me, Prophesy to these bones, and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, I will cause breath to enter you, and you shall live. I will lay sinews upon you, and cause flesh to come upon you, and cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and you shall live, and you shall know that I am the Lord. As prophesied, so I prophesied as I had been commanded, and as I prophesied, suddenly there was a noise, a rattling, and the bones came together, bone to its bone. I looked, and there were sinews upon them, and flesh had come upon them, and skin had covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, Prophesy to the breath, prophesy, mortal, and say to the breath, 
Thus says the Lord God, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain, that they may live. I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived, and stood on their feet, a vast multitude. Then he said to me, Mortal, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They say our bones are dried up, and our hope is lost. We are cut off completely. Therefore prophesy, and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, I am going to open your graves and bring you up from your graves, O my people, and I will bring you back to the land of Israel. And you shall know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and bring you up from your graves, O my people. I will put my spirit within you, and you shall live. I will place you on your own soil, then you shall know that I, the Lord, have spoken and will act says the Lord. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our gospel reading today is from the 11th chapter, according to John. Now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. Mary was the one who anointed the Lord with perfume and wiped his feet with her hair. Her brother Lazarus was ill. So the sisters sent a message to Jesus, Lord, he whom you love is ill. So the sisters sent a message to Jesus. And when he heard this, he said, this illness does not lead to death. Rather, it is for God's glory, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Accordingly, though Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus, after, her, after having heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Then after this, he said to the disciples, Let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now trying to stone you, and are you going there again? Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours of daylight? Those who walk during the day do not stumble, because they see the light of this world. But those who walk at night stumble, because the light is not in them. After saying this, he told them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I am going there to awaken him. The disciples said to him, Lord, if he has fallen asleep, he will be all right. Jesus, however, had been speaking about his death, but they thought he was referring merely to sleep. Then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. For your sake I am glad I was not there, so that you may believe. But let us go to him. Thomas, who was called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, Let us also go, that we may die with him. When Jesus arrived, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, some two miles away, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them about their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him while Mary stayed at home. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that God will give you whatever you ask of him. Jesus said to her, Your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one coming into the world. When she had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary and told her privately, The teacher is here and is calling for you. And when she heard it, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet come to the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. The Jews who were with her in the house, consoling her, saw Mary get up quickly and go out. They followed her because they thought that she was going to the tomb to weep there. When Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she knelt at his feet and said to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. 
When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who came with her also weeping, he was greatly disturbed in spirit and deeply moved. He said, Where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus began to weep. So the Jews said, See how he loved him? But some of them said, Could not he who opened the eyes of the blind have kept this man from dying? Then Jesus, again greatly disturbed, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone was lying against it. Jesus said, Take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, already there is a stench, because he has been dead four days. Jesus said to her, Did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone, and Jesus looked upward and said, Father, I thank you for having heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I have said this for the sake of the crowd standing here, so that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet bound with strips of cloth, and his face wrapped in a cloth. Jesus said to them, Unbind him and let him go. Many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary and had seen what Jesus did, believed in him. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Now, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be pleasing to you, O Lord, my God and my Redeemer. Amen. So I thought about this last week, the way that this Gospel reading and the way that real life intersect almost too closely. The way that they come together feels almost uncomfortable at this point, doesn't it? As we think about this man being sick and needing help, and Jesus being far away and coming too soon when he was already dead. As I thought of that, I couldn't help but reflect upon our current situation with the virus and the news headlines that we see. And it got me thinking. I was thinking about the way that we look at faith. And here's what I came up with, church. Real faith is for real life. I want to tell you a little bit more what I mean. Um, I want to start by saying that these things have connected faith and life in unique ways over the past couple weeks as we have figured out how to further live out this mission of the gospel while we are at the same time not gathering together. And I have been so impressed by the way that you have all handled this. The way that everyone has come together and has been able to respond even though life is different, even though we're trying to physically stay away and help prevent the spread of this, I've still seen a lot of work going on. Now, I'm not just talking about the ways that we've changed the way that we conduct Sunday worship, the way that you're worshiping differently right now. I'm talking about the way that you have shown that the church was never just a building, that the church was never even about the building, but that the church has always been you. It's always been the people. Now, one of the things about me, the pastor, is I have thought that the pastor doesn't really do the ministry work of the church. The job of the pastor is to equip the people, to equip the church with the promises, with the sacraments, and to send you out to express the love of God for you, yourself, as well as for the people that you meet in this life. Your neighbors, your family, acquaintances, the people that you run into. And a few months ago, I would have never guessed that anything like this would happen. I would have never imagined that we'd find ourselves in a situation like this, let alone that something like a coronavirus could even come to Western Minnesota. There are so many things that were here that were insulated from it. There are problems of large cities, of large populations that we just don't usually encounter here. But we've seen in the last week or so that we're not immune to all of this, that it still affects us here, that it is able to disrupt our way of life here in these far reaches. But even so, as it's been disrupted, as I've seen our church respond, we've all had to be on both sides of this equation. 
we have had to be cared for by others as well as we've had to care for others. And we've had to think of new ways of how to do that. So some examples of how you are all being the church right now has been, these are just some of the new ones. There have been gift cards. So one of our concerns has been local businesses and local healthcare workers at this time. So we've had a group of people go out and purchase some gift cards from local businesses and take down to our, to our area hospital here in Appleton. That way they could distribute it directly to them and to show them that they're appreciated during this time. We've had some people volunteer to help deliver groceries and to run errands for people that find themselves in the high risk categories that, find, that are more concerned about the possibility of, of contracting this. Uh, just Friday, we had somebody call in and I ma we matched them up with a person to go and pick their groceries up at the store here in town. Those are a couple of examples. We have the food shelf is still going on. We've changed our practices a little bit, asking people to call in. We have started a lot more phone ministries. There have been a number of people volunteer that are calling out to check on people in our community. And likewise, we've gotten this crash course in how to do online ministry, in addition to radio ministry. How do we reach people? How do we make sure that, that the Word of God and that our preaching is still getting out to encourage people during this time. And it's been hugely encouraging to me as we've encountered that. So between today's gospel reading and thinking about how the church is serving others during this time, made me think about this today. Like I said at the beginning, real faith is for real life. Think about that for a moment. We come together to worship as the church. And worship still, even now, serves as the heart of what we do and who we are. It's a place where we gather. It's a place where we hear who we are because we hear God's promises for us. And everything in worship on Sundays is meant to be a faith, a real faith that's lived out, not just inside these walls, but especially a faith that guides us on the outside and teaches us about a real life outside of these walls. And that's the kind of life situation that today's reading speaks to with Lazarus. Because it's one of those situations that we dread, but it's one that we can imagine all too well. We think about the progression of the story, we think about Lazarus being sick, and we can't help but think to what it would be like if that was one of our own loved ones. What if it was somebody that we care deeply for and we sent out this, this message that this person that we love needs your help? And then, in the process, before that help arrives, they die, and it's too late. But of course, the story doesn't end there. Jesus still shows up. He shows up and he consoles Mary and Martha. He shows up and tells them that he is the resurrection, and they still don't quite understand what he's getting at. Mary and Martha and this group that's with them are still deep in mourning and they don't know what to make. Even some of them go so far as to say, Jesus, if you were here, couldn't you have stopped this? They don't know what else to do besides lean into that grief. That's the way real life feels, doesn't it? Well, Jesus enters into that real life. He enters into that real situation that they are facing, one that we ourselves imagine and he shows us that faith is real for moments like that. And he shows us that faith doesn't mean that we can just skip to the end of the story, but that when faith happens in real life, sometimes it means we have to weather through those storms. We have to weather through the challenges because in the process of getting to the end, great things happen, growth happens, and in that time, Jesus shows up. It's tempting to want to skip to the end, isn't it? It's tempting to want to go from Lazarus is sick and has died to Lazarus is alive at the end. We want to do that in our own lives. We think about this quarantine and we want to just skip to the end. We want things to get back to normal. We want to just go from this point to where we are to where it's all over and not have to worry about all that uncomfortable time in the middle. But we don't get to do that. 
Lazarus, Mary, Martha, they don't get to do that. And unfortunately, we don't get to do that either. But what we find out is that in that middle ground, in that in-between space, is often the places where Jesus shows up, and it's often the places that faith changes everything. Where in your life can you think of a time where you found yourself in a situation? If you look back at a moment and see something difficult that you've gone through, but you look at the end of it and you say, this really showed me who I was. This taught me what was important in life. And we remember that it was only possible because you didn't jump from the beginning to the end. But that in that distance in between, that there was lots of, of faith that happened. There was lots of life that happened. It's not comfortable, and it's sure not easy. But church, that's the moment that we find ourselves in, that in-between time, that time where faith grabs a hold of us and claims us just as much as it does in the present. Just as much as it does in the beginning, just as much as it does at the end. So remember, as you find yourself today wanting to skip to the end of this part of our story, as you find yourself wanting to just get through this point and get to the end of what's going on, remember that your faith still has a hold of you. Remember today that Jesus is still showing up for you. Remember that resurrection, just as Lazarus was raised, that's your promise as well. You have been claimed by Christ. You are a child of God. And though you find yourself in a valley of dry bones, God will breathe life into this again. For you, for me, for all of us. Faith will hold on and faith will bring us through this. Thanks be to God. Now, will you pray with me? Turning our hearts to God, who is gracious and merciful, we pray for the church, the world, and all who are in need. God of life, bind your faithful people into one body. Enlighten the church with your spirit and bless the work of those who work for its renewal. Accomplish your work of salvation in us and through us. For the sake of the world, hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. God of life, you love the world you have made and you grieve when creation suffers. Restore polluted lands and waterways. Heal areas of the world ravaged by storms, floods, wildfires, droughts, and sickness. Bring all things to new life. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. God of life, show redemption to all who watch and wait with eager expectation whose longing for war to cease, those waiting for immigration paperwork to finalize, those seeking election, and those in dire need of humanitarian relief. Come quickly with your hope. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. God of life, you weep with those who grieve. Unbind all who are held captive by anxiety, despair, or pain. Lord, we pray especially today for Mary, Ron, Marlene, Louise, Jennifer, Christopher, Doris, Marty, Dolores, Carrie, Bob, Artis, Crystal, Hilda, Chuck, Stanley, Bonnie, the Southwest Diocese of Africa, God and all of those that we name silently in our hearts at this time. Fill us with compassion and empathy for those who struggle, and keep us faithful in prayer. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. God of life, we give thanks for opportunities for this congregation to collaborate with our community and caring for the needs of our neighbors. Strengthen our ties with other local congregations, agencies, and services. Hear us, O oh God, your mercy is great. God of life, you are our resurrection. 
We remember all those who have died and trust that in you they will live again, especially today, Rosemary's daughter. Breathe new life into our dry bones, that we too might live with you forever. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. According to your steadfast love, O God, hear these and all our prayers as we commend them to you through Christ our Lord. Amen. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Good people of God, near and far, on the radio, online, however it is that you come to us here, receive this blessing where you are as you are. Now is the acceptable time. Now is the day of salvation. Holy God, speaking, spoken, and inspiring, bless you, bind you, unbind you, and send you in love and in peace. Amen. Remember, love God, love one another, and amazing things will happen. Go in peace. Share the good news. Cool. I got this on Amazon. It's just a tripod, but then it plugs in and it's also a light ring. So.